Okay, Raba, I want to I want to teach you uh, a new thing. I want to tell you about uh, a new person that nobody cares about and has been dead for 400 years. Are you ready? Um. <laughs> yeah. Can you throw in some like uh, OG beef or like, if you will, some some rap battleness? Oh, that, my gosh. That, yeah, that would be perfect. Okay, great. Because it's this perfect tee up because the, the guy that, <laughs> that I want to talk about, um, a dead white German guy, um, he has like the greatest OG beef of all time, uh, which I think, you know, actually turns out uh, really affected the way that we understand the universe, which is pretty cool. Also, uh, it ties into something I think you're really into. You love like a nonfiction business book. Yes. You dig those. Yes. You dig those. Did you ever read Range? Yes. Range is is one of those business books I feel like you read one or two chapters and then you kind of got it. Mm -hmm. um, but what uh, what David Epstein makes the argument about in there is that being having lots of range and having sampled a lot of things makes you profoundly good at one. Yes. Yeah. I, I think there's definitely a there there. I think there's there's two different tracks there, though. I think there is a proper generalist. Mm. And then I think there's T-shaped talent. Mm -hmm. And then I think what we're going to talk about today with Leibniz is there's polymass where like there's almost like from the T-shape, they, they're they like a column <laughs> where they oh, can 100%. they can just go so deep. And so the generalist, I think there's a time and a place. Like if we want to bring it back to like marketing and startups, I think everybody at your startup, especially in the pre-growth phase and the growth phase, you need to have generalists because you need people to wear a bunch of different hats. And totally. then you want to transition into T-shaped where you have people that can go deep, but they can, that could still sit across multiple things. And then as you get old and crusty and you turn into a value company, not a growth company, that's when I think you bring in specialists, optimizers, because at that point you're trying to eke out, you know, you don't have lever poolers where th there's the big gains are usually lost and you don't need the big idea people anymore, or you need them to be in a room separate from the big org. That's just churning out um, things at a more optimal and efficient rate. Um, and so that's how I kind of think of those three people of like the generalists really important, but they're not going to be able to get you those last 10, five points to get it to perfect, but they're going to be great because they're going to sit up cross a bunch of stuff. T-shaped people, you hire them whenever because they're game changers. They're incredible. Mm. They can talk to everybody, but then they can go totally. deep on certain verticals. And then polymath is, is just, uh, you usually don't find them and it's very rare that they're going to come work for you. So I, and I would even say they, there's kind of, I think rare people just in the world. Um, and you know, the, the, the dude we're going to talk about today, uh, is probably the greatest example of a polymath. And you, you like this series is littered with great examples of people that are special in their own right. But, uh, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz uh, in my Western English or Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, uh, he, you know, uh, is a dude, uh, who is probably the quintessential polymathic person. He was a philosopher yep. um, and he was a mathematician, uh, an early example of like sort of a, 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 a mathematician's mathematician, like yep. created calculus. We'll talk about that. Um, and then also like weirdly, like a musician, a poet, like a person who just uh, was creative in every area that uh, he touched and then brought that creativity and in, in his inspiration from other areas into deeper levels of thought. So I want to dive into him. I think one of the first things that we can learn here is um, his his level of thinking was was rare, but in his era, he wasn't the only one like himself. And so one thing I thought would, that our audience would jam on today is a lot of his work was in, in, in simultaneous inspiration where other people were working on the same problems and yes. discovering solutions at the same time. Yes. And that feels really similar to a lot of the things that we've experienced over the last 10 years in our industry. Uh, and just to build on your point, so he was alive when Newton, John Locke, Spinoza, Pascal, uh, I mean, others. I mean, but that's like the the laundry list of the the who's who. Sure, um, which is is absolutely incredible to me. Yeah, um, that's like uh, Diddy and Dre and <laughs> right, <laughs> or or even like uh, you know even more near and dear PayPal Mafia kind of thing, where you're just like, oh, man, that sure. concentration of talent at one company is just absolutely absurd to think about. Yeah. And, and to have these like generational talents, people that, you know, of course, their legacies, 
uh, living for hundreds of years, I think is something really worth noting. And it's really, it's tough to know what people thought of them in that day. You know, one of the ways that they settled disputes was there were like historical societies. Yep. Uh, you know what we, we need a good like commerce society. Be like a that. rotary club kind of vibe. Yeah. We need like a, like a, like a fraternal order of commerce theory or something. <laughs> oh, I could be into that. Like, can we and, do something cool like skulls and bones though? Oh, for, oh, for sure. Like it, it'll yeah. definitely be problematic from yes. looking from the outside. You yes. could definitely be like, why does that exist? Um, but no, th you know, these societies would, would sort of like act as judge and jury yep. in disputes. And the greatest thing that Leibniz is probably known for um, outside of uh, some of his philosophy work, which we'll talk about is that he simultaneously discovered calculus at the same time as Isaac Newton, and yep. then they had major beef over it. Yes, yes, yes. What? Major, major beef. Do, uh, but they didn't have Twitter, so they couldn't work it out in real time. So they had to write letters and sort of argue through published works at each other. Uh, that's not how we work out beefs and problems and disagreements in DTC, for sure. <laughs> no, but it would be interesting because I think there's a certain, I don't want to say inefficiency, but there is a certain beauty to the inefficiency of having to refute or make an asynchronous rebuttal. Mm. Because then I can't, because I, I find the challenge with debates is, or real-time debates, like synchronous debates, it's the most charismatic, awesome person that can sway an argument, but they're not fact check there there's not any of this tether to reality it's pretty much who's the most like well spoken popular uses the the right vernacular to really make you sound smart etc so i think in a weird way it's kind of an interesting like it, it is like the og rap battle or diss track where you, you're kind of writing these things to each other, but waiting on the person to respond to then craft your answer where in D 2 C it can become, um, very real time. And I also think the challenge with D 2 C is it's such a ranging of terms where people will be talking about a company doing 500 K a year, which again, nothing wrong with that, but that's in a totally different place that needs totally different strategies and tactics and hirings than a company doing 25 million a year. And that totally. 25 million a year is going to be totally different than that company doing 50 or 75. And I think it gets lumped into it. And I think the, the fun part, but also kind of the the interesting part where I think a lot of the irritation comes in is like, everybody can usually be right. Totally. Well, there might be some truth in every person's individual experience and perspective. Uh, that's uh, Yeah, that's much more eloquently said. The too long didn't read, do what the ad account likes. And I think a lot of people <laughs> think that there is these tried and true tactics for this and that and the other thing. And there's just so much nuance to our businesses. And mm. then there's so much nuance to the scale that you're at. There's so much nuance to the context of the company. Are you capitalized? Are you not capitalized? That's going to change decisions. What are your logistics look like? What are your fulfillment lead times? There's all these variables that everybody wants to mute and just say it, it, it's it, in a weird way you know you want to see people the same as a human but at the same time everybody's a unique snowflake and i think that's the same <laughs> thing as I'm, I'm for real though right like that's the same thing it's as true. d2c businesses i've very rarely seen a d2c business be one-to-one -to, -one to another d2c business there's always something there's a there's a founder here or there's somebody that wants to get out or i have a bunch of money so i can spend it i don't have a bunch of money so i can't spend it and i think that's why you have to um, you know, the Bruce Lee absorb what's useful, reject what's useless. There's, um, you're like a, a, a repository of amazing one line quotes. <laughs> um, there's, there's a really interesting, uh, lesson to be learned too about his focus, uh, Leibniz's focus on so many different disciplines is, uh, because he made such an impact on each of them. You know, this polymathic ability is like just not being satisfied at being good at one thing. Yeah. Um, I think we see a lot of people like that in, in marketing where, uh, they really want to, uh, explore possibilities and bring that marketing level thinking and analysis to lots of different areas. And sometimes that means that they wind up in these like arguments or diss tracks, rap battles with people who are deep experts in one area and, you know, becoming, having to like get on the level with someone whose entire life and, and being is in there. What they don't often have is 
in in the case of you know Isaac Newton, uh, you know, in in his rap battle uh, with uh, 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 Gottfried Leibniz, the the issue that arises is when Newton won, he then wrote a book basically celebrating his own win. Um, like you, you, what, what, what is really interesting about this particular record is, you know, the, the taking the victory lap is kind of in poor taste sometimes. Uh, but you know, I guess when, when you're, when you're the champ, um, you know, you're, you, it's within your rights to take the victory lap. Um, but I think you lost with style. How's that? Leibniz lost with style. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a couple lessons, I think, for our listeners here. One, always brag on yourself. There's definitely a, <laughs> a limitation to staying in the non-douchey category, but mm. that's one of the things that I tell people all the time on my team, and I try and do it personally as well, where I'll write every couple of weeks just a Friday update for marketing, because you don't realize that all these other people have no idea what you're doing. Engineering has no clue. Product has no clue. And mm. a lot of times marketing is the cool kids in the organization. And so you want to bring these people along and show them what's going on. And that just really helps accrue, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, political capital within the company, like, oh, marketing's doing all this stuff. So you definitely want to brag on yourself. And the other thing too, is like, there's just a certain aspect of, man, when you do something great, like, canonize it. There, there's something about when you put it mm -hmm. into some sort of digestible that other people, kind of what we were talking about with the, the, the whole South by Southwest event, like people experience the world in stories. And if you can give these people a story to then tell their friends, to then tell their friends, it's just going to be a more impactful way to disseminate information versus, you know, trying to penetrate the academia with very crude or not crude, but, you know, possibly elegant equations, but without wrapping that in a story, it, it gets into a place of it. The vehicle is much harder to ship than what Leibniz just didn't do a good job of that. And I think you, yeah, you should be your biggest, you should be your best fan and well, your it, biggest it could fan. Be, it could be like, uh, you know, the discipline of selling is often sometimes different than discipline of creating and oh, like totally being different, very good at selling an idea, you know, sometimes has, uh, is opposed to, it's like in direct opposition to the type of talent that would be somebody who creates a new discipline of math out of, out, out of thin air. Here's a, here's an interesting thing. Calculus itself, you know, if you were tortured in high school or in college with calculus, Calculus at at the root of what it is solving, it's the study of continual change. Yes, and you know you have uh, hence you have really, integrals, hence derivatives, right? And you have this really interesting hook at Fermat around sort of the way that you're naming uh, various media properties that you've created. You know, um, uh, the geometry of growth, for instance. Like yep. each one of these areas of mathematical discipline study a particular element of some truth, and this was a new thing in that actually there is something that has been undiscovered in that there is a science of continuous change. And now for yep. him, for Leibniz, it was maybe area under a curve on a graph. Yep. But for our industry, the science of continuous change is that the marketing discipline never stands still. And there are things that need to be rethought over and over and over again, including like the funnel. And we could talk about that in a second. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. But I want to just jump back to that previous point where I think it's so important to distinguish between the creation versus the marketing and selling and branding, mm -hmm. um, because they are both really important. And one of the things that I think was so magical about Apple was that Steve Jobs had Wozniak who was the creator, but couldn't sell, you know, a glass of water to somebody dying of thirst in the desert because that wasn't his thing. Sure. But Steve Jobs also had this beautiful idea of never working from the technology to the customer, but working from the customer need, the job to be done to the customer back to the technology. And that's why Apple's products, I, I know you're a green bubble guy and sub, you know, objectively Android's probably, tech, well, yeah, but Android's tech, there, there was, I mean, even now you could argue it's still better than Apple's, like the actual tech. But the whole point is nobody really cares about the tech besides the actual people like on the fringe, like the early adopters. When you get to the middle of the curve and then you get to the laggards, people care about the story. And that's one of the things that I thought Apple is just brilliant at. Because if you think of the retina display, Android mm -hmm. had better, higher resolution displays than the retina display when it went out. 
but who's going to say X pixel by Y pixel? Nobody. But what can I tell you, Philip? Oh, I got the new iPhone. It has the retina display. Right. And so being able to package the story is almost just as important. Yeah. And the brand is is a story, right? And so being able to package that story, but also be able to have the technological firepower to give you that because you can't like you can't put lipstick on a pig. You know what I mean? Like there's only so far that can go where you know, there was a little bit of lipstick on the pig at the early iPhone, but the way he branded it, it was so brilliant where when you can get to a place of marketing where you make every bug a feature, that that that's just God tier marketing. And I think that's what Leibniz was missing candidly. Well, probably. I mean, especially, you know, his his particular brand of philosophy uh, on its own kind of became known as a footnote because the people that uh, learned and built on his ideas were the ones who became known as sort of the monster philosophers of the day, like yep. like uh, Immanuel Kant or Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, you know, these these people are known as sort of the modern like philosophers that changed the way that we think about the world. Yes. Leibniz was the one who inspired them with some of his own ideas, which really had a lot to do with this like concept of ex- abstraction. How do we take something that we can observe? And theorize there might, there might it might be made of smaller truths. So you know something that's physical matter in the world might be made of smaller particles, and that was like really wild to think about back in the yes. day. Um, just as a total aside, he he is actually you know credited as the person who created the binary number system and sort of recognizing it as like canonically zero and one. And by the way, this is wild. Uh, a really interesting book. You like uh, nonfiction, but I don't know if you jam on mathematics uh, so much. Great book to read. It's called Zero, um, The Biography of a Dangerous Idea. And uh, it's by Charles C. If I, I read it 20 some years ago. Um, he talks about how like you know how like people were called heretics for talking, you know, saying, oh, well, the world is round or yes, the, the idea of zero was itself a heretical idea yes. uh, at one point in time. So Leibniz, you know, kind of created all of these incredible uh, thoughts and, and philosophies, but he has a branding problem. Uh, to your point, not great at the branding. So his idea of abstraction uh, was he called monadology. <sighs> <laughs> that 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 does not pass the sniff test of monad. Uh, uh, you're, you like yeah. say, do you like saying monad, Raba? No, no, and I'm, I'm so surprised too because that's one letter away from almost like gonad and like, like it's just uh, not not the path for me. But hey, you know may, maybe there's a a, um, a sexier German word for that. that I think that was German. Trans- I think that's oh, the that problem. Is German. <laughs> oh ooh, yeah. German's a hideous language. Uh, great culture, cool people, amazing cars and engineering, yeah. but um, not into the glottal stops. Yeah, no. The <laughs> monad. Monad. I think it was borrowed from Greek um, uh, originally. Oh, that but makes like, sense. Th- so like having this idea of like a basic or originating substance, uh, you know, his idea was you could keep breaking things down into their original you know, most basic, uh, components. And for him being a religious and learned man, uh, Leibniz theorized that potentially there was like a God particle, a spiritual truth at the center of all physical matter. Mm -hmm. And so if you could abstract things away, uh, to their smaller, more, uh, smaller and smaller scales and more essences. Uh, and, you know, it's funny is it took 200 years, but we realized, well, there's molecules and there's yeah. atoms and then there's a nucleus and it's made of particles and and then we have quarks. And now, like, you keep going deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole. Um, he theorized this before anyone else. Yes. Um, which I think is a really interesting thing because he's he was wrong until a couple hundred years later when he's right. You know, that's that's usually the arc of things, to be fair, <laughs> where um, <laughs> you, you, there's just people before their time that, you know, they just don't have the, whether it's, you know, cultural headwinds, societal headwinds, et cetera, that is just not, not ready. Like there's that old Buddhist saying, the, the teacher will appear when the student is ready. Oh, ooh. Yeah. That's deep. Um, yeah, it's deep. What you... In his, in, in sort of the Leibniz view of the world, um, you know, he had this idea too about equivalency. Um, 
And you've you've heard the the ship of Theseus, Theseus, of course, right? Yeah, it's yeah, great. So, but, but bring the listeners along because yeah. I don't know if it's uh, uh, it's a popular parable, but just to make sure everybody's yeah, having if, fun. Yeah, uh, if you know the the sort of like a uh, Greek philosophical question about the ship of Theseus, that if uh, over time this uh, ancient ship was replaced piece by piece, board by board. Um, you know, nail by nail, is it still the same ship or is it a different ship? And uh, Leibniz, you know, in Leibniz's law would probably argue that there is no true equivalency, um, that two things cannot be truly identical. Um, and it's, you know, I'm even drawing a false equivalency, you know, equating it directly to like something like the ship of Theseus. It's that this idea that even if two things are identical, even at their most spiritual level in this God particle idea, they can never truly be equivalent because there is more than one of them. So they are, they are identical, but they're not the same. And that is such an interesting thing because, and this is what I want to get you in here. It has everything to do with the perspective of the observer saying, I can see two things. They can't be identical. They can be distinguished from each other. It has everything to do with your perspective. It's a, exactly right. And uh, I think you just broke everybody, all the NFT maxis there, because uh, that, <laughs> that, that goes against their whole the whole thesis. But yeah, so I think there's a couple things going on here. One, it depends on where you derive identity. Mm. Do you derive identity from the physical or the metaphysical? Because if you derive identity from the metaphysical, then the materials are just a representa- representation of that. And that's why it's such an interesting thought experiment, because usually people have very vigorous, nobody really goes, ah, I don't care. You're like, oh, no, it's not the same or it is the same. And then what gets really interesting is at what point? So is it 51 percent? Is it 70% of the ship replaced? Is it 1% of the ship replaced? Like if one plank is different, does that make the right. ship totally different? And so that's where I think it gets really nuanced where it's like, okay, if you do think that the ship isn't the same, at what point are you allowed or at what point does that identity get shattered? Is it the third plank? Is it the fifth plank? Exactly is it right. when you replace the whole? And so I think that's what the beauty of the thought experiment is with the ship of Theseus is that you get to really dive down into people's souls in a, in a really interesting, meaningful way where you can see, do they care about the metaphysical? Like, is this a thing of sentimentality of like, oh my gosh, this, this means something to me. And this is, this material is just a representation of an ideal that can never be replaced. Or is it that the material is the thing? And if you're replacing the material, then that, that's totally different. And so I think that that's where it gets really that's- interesting. Let's put that in the context of business um, and sort of specifically the business of commerce. So when you're thinking about uh, your uh, the the ability to replicate success in one business to the next based on a handful of tactics and even maybe a makeup of the same stack of software. So what I see a lot of times is uh, folks looking at one business, which maybe they are in the same category, maybe they even sell the same product, maybe they have similar packaging, and making an assumption that there is an equivalency of tactics and software stack that worked in one context that is directly transferable. It's identical, right? It can be replicated in another context. And I think that we have, there are some schools of thought that like, well, no, there's just like a school of best practices where we can repeat success. Like there's a truth that's a truth that's a truth. There's a fundamental truth and that's that humans' uh, behavior in buying things and meta's predictability means that we can replicate success from one business to the next. Um, I think Leibniz would argue is that there is no such thing as equivalency. Like, it can't be identical because there's two of them. Right. So you have two different, there are two, there are two businesses. They can't be identical. There's two of them. And that's where I want your input here is how, how replicable is success uh, in the role of the marketer in deploying similar tactics, similar strategies, similar software stacks? Um, is there, is there truly a truth to be found in that? I mean, it's a fantastic question. I think for me, I don't like to think in, terms of best practices, Mm. I prefer frameworks. And then I can take pieces of those frameworks to then 
layer on to my business because there's there again there's nuances to everything there's the the great quote no man ever steps in the same river twice for it's not the same river and it's not the same man right. and i think that's the exact same thing because when these businesses were if you started a business back in the day when facebook was ripping you could build a whole business on facebook mm. you didn't need anything else Whereas now that's just not the case. You are not going to take a business from zero to one just on paid ads. And candidly, you don't want to. Like the people that are really dependent on meta ads or paid ads in general that are buying revenue are having a really hard time right now. The people that have organic, the people that have community that are then augmenting those with paid ads are doing fine. And so I think that's the challenge is like nothing's ever the same. There, there's just no. So this is kind of the thing of like that ship at DC is like nothing's ever the same. However, right. I do think there are frameworks, there are first principles that you can adopt to give yourself a really awesome opportunity to then figure out which pathway to go where you can build a beachhead and then you can understand where do I want to go from said beachhead. But if you're just doing best practices or if you're just mimicking things, again, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's more of a drop shipper style mentality where that's not a business, that's an arbitrage play where you just see an arbitrage in the market and you're just trying to cl basically clear that market and you take some money with that arbitrage versus building a brand and building a product that people know, love and care about. It, it, those are two just orthogonal thought processes. And I think that's where a lot of people get caught up where they say they're building a brand or a business, but it's really just an arbitrage opportunity. The other thing that I'll say too, and not to be too negative, because I, I love entrepreneurship and I think people should try everything that, that makes sense to them, is that a lot of people are building features that are masquerading as businesses. Mm. And, and that's something that I see a lot where you just get a lot of buy-in, but you either end up a total addressable market is a really low ceiling. Um, there, there's just headwinds that you need to understand, okay, this seed is not going to grow into a forest, how can I plant more flowers that then the bees can come pollinate to then build this beautiful garden? Because if not, like it's just too expensive to hire a gardener to plant a plant every time you want to grow one. This actually brings us back to our original point about being, a, a, you know, this idea of the polymath. Um, at an early stage of a business, you you have to, uh, if if not truly polymathic, but you have to be more generalist in the way that you approach problem solving. You have to do all of these things. Uh, you have to be both the uh, the seed sower and the pruner and the garden planter and the water. Like you have to do yes. all of those things. It's as you grow that you you become much more prone to specialization. W one of the th the the lessons to learn here, though, too, is. Um, uh, on my journey to research more about Leibniz and for this episode, I actually, uh, I really liked his his idea of uh, monadology as <laughs> as sort of this idea of non-determinism. And that's how I've kind of thought of Fermat, um, is that uh, my website is not your website. There is no equivalent website in the future. Websites can be something that's specific in the moment to a particular piece of creative that can, you know, live just for the context of what needs to what needs to exist to close the deal with that one customer and what they need at that moment. It's funny because that disrupts our idea of the funnel and the you does know, it. I but it makes the I funnel not a does. universal thing. It makes it specific in that moment to that one person. What is the funnel for that person in that moment? That, right. That's a, that, well, that's exactly right. So I think it's actually not breaking the idea of the funnel, but making the funnel instead of having this singular funnel that somebody has to go through. Now you can make this highway of conversion paths where previously you had this one one way to go everything for everyone. And, and now the technology has now surpassed that ideal. So why don't we talk to people? I think it's more so in almost going back to the, the monadic, is that mm -hmm. the, is yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. Mon yeah. monadic ideal of like, we can now help you build conversion paths for all these different customers, which kind of breaks the idea. So I guess I see what you're saying because the way I define or bifurcate marketing from sales is marketing is selling one to many sales is selling one to one. Yeah. And now you're kind of seeing a blur of the lines with technology. Now I can market almost one to one, not in the actual literal sense, but in that persona jobs to be done, where that person is on their customer journey, what I know about them. So, and so it gets into almost a, you know, the OG when you finally could get targeting with Facebook. Like, I think that's kind of where the, the, the marketing savants are going to start to head to where it's like, man, instead of me having to think about this one universal theorem, 
What if I could think of 10 theorems or 20 theorems or 40 theorems that would encompass the whole customer base instead of having to reduce everyone to say, hey, this is Philip. He lives in Florida. He has a Vision Pro. He like that, that, that's not <laughs> meaningful. But if you find something around the idea of, oh, Philip has this job to be done, he's at this stage of his conversion cycle, this is going to be the most exciting pathway for him to get to a conversion or to get to value in the quickest amount possible. That to me is actually an extrapolation of the funnel, not necessarily uh, a, a singularity of the funnel, if that makes what, sense. What if what if I s- said it different? I love the way that you put it because it's very practical. I think to put it in the in the monadic terms to your to your point <laughs> is what if the funnel if we got if we broke the funnel down and we said it there is there is something there's a smaller particle than the funnel what if we we break it down and we find out there's actually a lot more funnels in there in the funnel right there's there's smaller funnels to be had and they are like at, we're in search of a very specific funnel that is sort of bound by time and space that is just, it exists only for this moment and it works for that customer at this time. And that's something that we just could not have actually delivered 20 years ago, which would be like, like basically 200 years ago, as far as technology is concerned, like we just exactly. didn't have the technology. It was, right? it was a technology barrier and you, you just sparked something in me. I think what's going to happen is the funnel goes away and what happens is, um, so I got to go to this a uh, long time ago, it was five years ago, seven years ago. There's this guy named BJ Fogg. He has the Fogg behavior model. Wonderful dude out of uh, Stanford. But anyways, there's an um, a exercise he has in there called star fishing. And basically, you would plot all the paths to a conversion. And so I think the funnel is actually going to become eradicated and you're going to start to have this hub and spoke model where the spokes are all these different conversion paths that then terminate at the center, which is the conversion. I think that's going to be a much more meaningful way to look at the funnel than this OG conversion consideration or uh, awareness consideration conversion, where now Mm -hmm. you can have all these different pathways for all these different people to come on a journey and all all roads end in Rome kind of thing. There's a, uh, I love that. Uh, We talked uh, a little bit about this in our uh, Future Commerce Learning series. Shout out to uh, Future Commerce Learning, futurecommerce.com slash learning, uh, where we talk about the loyalty loop as sort of like someone's always in the consideration process of buying something. And where you enter and exit the loop is where you uh, is 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 the job today. Um, yes. And there, that's also made up of, of a ton of funnels. So there's a bunch of ways of thinking about this. Here's you and talk about branding problem. Uh, the funnel itself, everybody can visualize the funnel. Uh, yes. I, I love that there's a direct tie to the marketing funnel. Um, if you if you follow me backwards here, uh, the marketing funnel was created by a guy who nobody would ever know by name. Um, his name is Elias St. Elmo Lewis, uh, who uh, was inducted into the Marketing Hall of Fame posthumously in 1951. It's a crazy story. Um, I didn't even know there was a marketing n- HOF, but let's see, go. First how ballot. Many, how many times are you going to hear a story like this? Nowhere else other than decoded. Um, no one knows where the marketing funnel, the idea of the marketing com- funnel came from, although it is ubiquitous and we talk about it all the time. Uh, this man came up with this idea because he was this, uh, a calculator and adding machine salesperson. Yes. And he was trying to visualize the journey of a customer and getting people to get to adding machines. Do you know what the fundamental thing that made an adding machine work was binary digits? Um, so I, you know, uh, the marketing funnel, we could trace it all back uh, to Mr. Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, uh, wow. the polymath. That was um, that was Hall of Fame. Yeah, tie in. That was a that was time is a flat circle kind of shit, Philip. Yeah. That was very impressive. Thank you so much. Uh, now you know how my brain works, and now you got you know a little bit more about the polymath uh, Gottfried Leibniz. And uh, man, this has been such a great series. I really enjoyed doing this with you, Raba. 